Hello and welcome to another edition of Door County Today. I'm your host, Paul Renier of Door County Nature and Travel. July is the heart of Door County's tourism season. Lodges and parks are buzzing with visitors. One park, Peninsula State Park in Fish Creek, is also home to American Folklore Theater, whose theater under the stars has entertained generations of the peninsula's natives, locals, and tourists. On this edition of our show, we'll take a close look at AFT's new musical, Windjammers, whose subject matter is the tall ships that once plied the waters of Green Bay and Lake Michigan. We'll also visit Peninsula Music Festival, now entering its 61st season of world-class symphonic concerts. PMF's 2013 season starts on August 6th at the Door Community Auditorium, with music by Beethoven and Britton, featuring acclaimed violinist Ilya Kahler. We'll talk with PMF's conductor Viktor Jumpolsky and Executive Director Sharon Gratzmacher about why PMF continues to thrive. Sadly, the grand old man of the Door County art scene, Abe Cohn, passed away May 10th at age 88. Abe was widely beloved as a person and a potter. He and his wife Ginka operated the gallery, The Potter's Wheel, for six decades. We're so pleased we were able to talk with Abe this past fall about his life and art. Finally, we'll visit with Teresa Evans, whose Stone Path Yoga has become a beacon of peace and health to the Northern Door community. Teresa practices a type of yoga called Critical Alignment Therapy, and its many devotees include a broad cross-section of the peninsula's population. Now let's start this month's show with a visit to American Folklore Theater. This year is AFT 2013 summer season includes three musicals as usual and we have our world premiere Windjammers as well as the return of Musky Love and Loose Lips Sink Ships. All three are nautically themed which is kind of fun. Windjammers it takes place in 1876 on the Great Lakes. It's a three-masted schooner and the story is really about a captain and a boy. Who is thrust into being a man because his father's dead and he's trying to save the farm and he goes to work on this ship because this is the only job that might save his farm. He has to grow up really quick. It really is a great story of the transformation of a boy into a man. Then the cat becomes interested in a woman. The woman has her own sort of uh, situation that she needs to, to get help from the captain for. And the captain is brand new to captaining. He's the youngest captain on the Great Lakes. Crusty old Fred. He's the, the first mate, and yet he's been um, passed on to be the captain by a younger fellow. And so you got that dynamic working within, working for someone who's like 33 years old, whatever. He has a little problem with the drinking, but and so maybe that's what's kept him back. He's trying to um, assert himself as, as this, the old way was the best way and this new captain is the new way, and it's this clash of the old and the new. Uh, and also the boy, he, he resents the boy because he's, he's educated, he reads, unlike my character. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a lot of mystery about what's gonna happen to each of these characters because all of them are presented with circumstances that are new to them. The writers of Windjammers are Robin Sher and Clay Zambo. Robin is from LA and Clay is from the East Coast. The very first time they ever met was in working on Windjammers. I'm part of a musical theater writers workshop association in Los Angeles and they reached out to theaters to see if theaters wanted new musicals written specifically for them and uh, American Folklore Theater gave us a, a list of sorts of the ideas and the thoughts that they had and I came, I would happen to be a book writer involved in the project and wrote them a bunch of pitches for ideas. I had uh, Robin and Clay come for a visit to AFT because I think it's really important for writers to get a feel for the county of, and, and particularly obviously a feel for AFT. We had sort of specific parameters that that we needed to follow, uh, you know, the length of the show. We could include certain subject matter but we should probably not include other subject matter. All of which was not restrictive so much as it was freeing because now we know who we're writing for. I stood at the back of the theater the, the other night and was watching our preview audience and seeing children. But here they were just sort of scattered throughout an audience. And I thought, some of these kids are seeing their first play tonight and they're going to come back. We're going to give them a good experience and they're going to want to see plays for the rest of their lives. The director of Windjammers is Molly Rohde and Molly has been with the company for uh, a number of years. I think her first season with us was 2007, so 
Um, she knows AFT, and uh, Molly has done a lot of directing in Milwaukee. She's directed for Skylight, she's directed for Chamber Theater. She directed Main Traveled Roads, which she originally was in for us up here, and then she did a production of it for Chamber Theater with, by the way, one of the actresses who is now with us this summer. So there's all this kind of crossbreeding that goes on. Um, Molly is working with Lisa Schlenker, who is the property mistress for Skylight, but she's also a set designer. She designed the set for Main Traveled Roads that Molly directed down there, and she is the designer for Windjammers. So the two of them have a really good relationship, and we knew that we wanted there to be something different and special about the set, because it takes place on a three-masted schooner, and there's no way that anybody, especially AFT with a set that's got to go up and come down every performance, can do a three-masted schooner on stage. So we're, we're definitely taking stylistic and artistic license with how we're going to represent the ship. And I think what Lisa and Molly have come up with is really ingenious. The music is fantastic. This music is so different from what other people have heard at AFT before, and um, it really is great. There's a lot of variety in the music, and I think it's really compelling and beautiful and um, exciting. Um, he, he, there's one section of the show where there's a squall and a storm, and he decided to personify the, the elements with female voices. The storm elements of, of our show are the big movement pieces. We can't have rain pouring down, we can't actually have wind, but we can suggest it and if we do our job, we make you feel like you've been through it. As the lights go down and you, the, the, the story gets a little more serious, it starts off very light and, and it just, it's, it's quite astonishing to be in this place and sort of see the relationship between the beauty of it and the, the story that we're telling. When you look through the, the people who were involved in the early days of this festival, it's a who's who of the classical world in the 50s and 60s. Frederick Stock was with the Chicago Symphony, and he had the idea, and I think talked to a lot of the same people who ended up founding it. He originally wanted to actually um, have the orchestra perform outside. Um, we were founded by a gentleman named Lawrence Heisey. He was a businessman from Milwaukee who um, was a devout Moravian, and many people don't realize that the Peninsula Music Festival has its roots in the traditions of music in the Moravian Church. And he attended the very first early Moravian Music Festival, and he met a conductor named Thor Johnson who founded that festival. And he asked Thor Johnson if he would come to Wisconsin and create a festival similar to that here in Door County. So Thor Johnson came here and met with what they called the Festival Committee. And he said that he would start the festival here if they raised $10,000. We jokingly say that once they all picked themselves up off the floor um, from the shock, they decided to do it. And they did. It never crossed anybody's mind that you couldn't have a world-class professional symphony orchestra in Door County, Wisconsin. Thor Johnson just went and picked people and told them you will come here and play in the orchestra and they just did it because you didn't say no to Thor Johnson in those days from what I've told and they received a paycheck of $100. For the first uh, 39 years they sat on folding chairs in a school gymnasium that has a built-in stage. The place was actually not very suitable for the concerts because the stage was uh, extremely small and because the uh, seats were on folding chairs and so people were uncomfortable sitting there and plus there were only 500 seats available in the hall. When we had a pianist playing with orchestra we had to build up the front, especially to put a piano on something. And some of the percussion instruments were not on stage, they were in the wings somewhere. <laughs> Thanks to the generosity of um, the Hislop sisters, we got this beautiful auditorium and 21 years ago we moved in here. The sound carries really nicely and it, it's an easy place to play. Even when it fills up, and usually, you know, some of that gets a bit muffled in some other holes, but here it just still carries really nicely. This hall is built perfect 
the acoustics here are flawless. You will be amazed. I just really like this auditorium a lot. The, the size, the feeling of it, it, even the look of it. It's um, not a huge space, so it's a little more intimate. The acoustic is beautiful here, which was not the case in gymnasium. So it was really wonderful, almost like a surprise for us when uh, some lady decided to make a large donation to build uh, Door County Auditorium, which is already almost like a 20 years old. Thor Johnson um, died quite suddenly in um, the early 70s of a brain tumor. He was only in his 60s, and the festival suffered from founder syndrome for about 10 years while they, with guest conductors, um, interim people, while they tried to figure out what to do. Um, luckily, Bob Marcellus, who was the principal clarinetist of the Cleveland Orchestra, took over the search. There were a series of people who auditioned, but Victor, I think, was one of his choices, and he really brought Victor here. This will be Victor's 27th season with the Peninsula Music Festival. People who haven't seen an orchestra or this orchestra before, I think, would be surprised at the high level of the group. Victor has brought in wonderful musicians, uh, and, you know, they've clearly elevated the level of the orchestra, and we play up to that. You know, every, every other day is a new concert. You can imagine that it is the hardest thing for us to present nine concerts in three weeks and make it so varied and interesting. It is not an easy three weeks, but what uh, many of the musicians say, it's some of their best music making of the whole year. It's much more than a gig, and I think if you asked that of anybody in the orchestra, they'd say the same thing. Um, being here as long as I have, it really is a family. I love coming here, not only for Door County, because it's beautiful, but the orchestra is so rewarding from the conductor, who's fabulous, to the fellow musicians, and love it. It's my favorite time. The festival runs August 7th through the 25th, and we perform every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for three weeks, nine different concerts with no weekends. Well, if you've never heard a classical music concert before, come hear us, because it's a spectacular orchestra, and you'll get a feeling for classical music that you wouldn't in any other venue. And the idea of a world-class symphony here, it's, it's kind of crazy, and that's what makes it fun. My name is Abe Cohen. I'm a potter in Fish Creek. My studying of clay work was primarily in Madison. I, I was going to graduate as a, as a teacher, and I found that just teaching wasn't enough, and a group of us decided to go to Paris and do some more studying. And then I was still working two-dimensionally with drawing and painting. And there I spent a lot of time at Académie Julia. I was on a GI Bill, which allowed me to, to buy my materials rather inexpensively. And I was able to travel. I was able to buy art books. It was very gratifying to find other Americans at the same time came back from Paris and I was working at an art school in Milwaukee. I wanted to be able to do some more clay work, so my uncle owned a property in downtown Milwaukee. I rented a basement space from him. That got me started. Picked up some second-hand wheels and I opened a, a studio. But the clay work came primarily from work in Milwaukee with, in my own studio and working with other potters. My mom in the 1950s, um, at the time that she met Abe, she was a dancer. She developed a case of polio, which was going around at the time, and needed to recuperate and find something creative to do while her body was healing. And her sister suggested she might try ceramics. So my mom signed up for a 
class. And she needed exercise, and this was one of the main things that she evolved into. My mother's cousin, who is also an artist, was visiting from California, and my mom said, well, let's have a party for you. And why you have friends also who live in Milwaukee. Why don't you invite some of your friends? One of the friends happened to be this same young potter, Abe Cohn. Abe and uh, my mom's cousin had met when my dad was studying art in Paris. They were part of the same circle of artists and actually lived in the same house. Mom started taking classes from Abe, enjoyed the wheel. They hit it off right away. Somewhere along the line, one of Abe's students was familiar with Door County and suggested it was beautiful up here. Maybe they could find property or a place to sell the art, and they explored it. Lo and behold, it worked. It was wonderful. The, the story goes on because you keep asking questions as you grow, as you get involved in, in the, the mechanics of almost any art form. There's ways of developing color, uh, form and coming up with solutions that work for you it doesn't have anything to do with anything other than your own mind searching for an answer. Lots of people still don't really understand clay work. They're, they're, they look down on it because it's a material that you have to get your hands wet and so-called dirty. My dad is always thinking like an artist. Whatever he might pick up, he might be able to put to use somehow in his pottery. Well, this is, this is 57 years of this potter's wheel in Fish Creek. He's been a potter longer than that. And unfortunately, about four years ago, just a little under four years ago, um, there was an explosion and his kill exploded. That was a huge setback, all of the work that had been lost, and it was just really demoralizing and what are we going to do now? Coincidentally with that, my mother took ill and then my father began to have health issues. So he really hasn't been on the wheel making new pots for, I would say, almost four years. He's now 87 and a half, and about a month ago he got back on the wheel and is making new pottery. And with the help of my brother, Jonathan, this summer he's gotten back out in his studio and has been glazing all that old work. Uh, without his own kill, he's been having it fired by John Dietrich up in Ellison Bay, as well as Chad Luberger at Plum Bottom Pottery. And that's been just totally wonderful and helpful and just speaks to what a great community we have and with the ceramic artists up here. The main guiding light is to be able to be inventive with whatever you're working with, whether it's with clay or any other material. For me, yoga is the coming together of our body, our mind, and our breath. Creating a space where we can be quiet, we can turn inside of ourselves, and we can figure out what the heck is going on. One of my teachers uses the term, we're not, we're not human beings, we're spirits walking around in human bodies trying to figure out how to do it gracefully. The gentleman who created Critical Alignment Therapy is Gert Ben Liawen and he's from Amsterdam. He started noticing that a lot of people that were coming to classes were coming in pain and had injuries. And a lot of it he realized was related to repetitive stress movements, which is very common in, with the way we live our lives today with our cell phones and our computers and everything that brings us into a forward motion repeating movement. And he created this black strip that we lay on in each of my classes. And it just seems like such a simple thing, but he realized that people were locked up in the middle of their bodies between the shoulder blades. So he just sort of started this investigational process and came up with critical alignment therapy. And then my teacher that I studied with in Mexico, where I actually got my certification, 
was a student of his for three and a half years, Brigitte Longueville. And she still has a studio and teaches in um, Zipoliti, Mexico. What made a connection for me with the type of yoga that I practice, critical alignment therapy and therapeutic yoga was, well, first of all, it was the only yoga I was exposed to. It happened to be the first, and I, I feel so blessed that this was it, you know. I was a meditator before I was a yoga practitioner. And the way I came to yoga was through meditation. My husband signed us up to take a vacation and in Mexico where we had never been and he thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to do a yoga and meditation intensive? And I remember so clearly the first day doing the, doing the yoga practice and tears just rolling down my face and thinking, I have come home. This is what I'm meant to be doing. I never, never thought at that point I would be teaching it, but I knew I would be practicing for the rest of my life. Before I got into yoga, I was a critical care nurse. So I've always been in the healing profession. I always knew that that was my role. As I worked with people through the critical alignment therapy, through the asana practice, I could see the benefits. I had started to work with people individually, privately, but I had this feeling that there was something missing and I wasn't sure what it was. When I saw this brochure for something called somatics, I had no idea what it was. I read it. And as soon as I read it, it was like one of those, okay, this was late, this is no accident, I'm meant to be doing this. What I loved about somatics is it says, nobody can fix you but you. You have to feel it. If you can't feel it, if you're not aware of it, then you can't fix it. We don't even call ourselves therapists, we call ourselves educators, somatics educators. Because my role is to, to educate you, to help you feel what it is that's going in your body. I remember, I, I think it was just about a year ago that I uh, came to see Teresa and I remember telling her that it was in March or April and I remember telling her that my daughter was going to be married in August and um, and that um, you know I really wanted to walk my daughter down the aisle and have a first dance with her and I was really afraid you know, that I wasn't going to be able to do that. I mean, I was, I was walking that badly. And I was also looking forward to spring trout fishing. And at that point, I didn't think I'd be able to do it because I, I felt like if I ever did get in the stream, I'd never be able to get out. She started to talk to me about somatics uh, right from the start. And right from the start, it made sense to me in a way that um, other exercise and body work and yoga never really made sense. I mean, there, to me, there, there was a qualitative difference between what Teresa was saying and what I'd done before. I remember Teresa saying to me, when is that wedding? And I said, uh, in August, she said, well, by August, we'll have you walking strong and tall and free and down the aisle with your daughter. And that happened. And it did happen. And, uh, and I remember having a first dance with my daughter and being kind of just amazed at uh, how free and uh, loose and e easy and almost youthful that I felt inside. Mainly what's so different about this work is you're, you're going very deep into your supportive postural muscles, you're reconnecting your brain with how your muscles work. And what I've learned is you truly forget how to use your muscles from past injuries, which is my situation. Five years ago, I felt a lot older than I do now. And I don't know, uh, it's just, it's been a wonderful thing. Thanks for joining us today. Remember to come back often to find out more about Door County's history, landscapes, businesses, and people. For updated information about this beautiful peninsula, visit doorcountytoday.com. I'm Paul Renier for Door County Today. See you next time.